question him even driving, let alone being able to compete at this level. He was off the back. He was mid-pack mid, mid -pack or something, and just so much pace. I could see him coming. So he's getting closer and closer and closer. Everything just worked perfectly in that race, and then the leaders sort of held each other up. You've got Wind Cup up on the outside of Most, and here comes Van Gisbergen. Oh! He's gone down the inside. That is unbelievable. Shane Van Gisbergen is the winner at Sandown after 36 crazy laps. As it turned out, we ended up winning every race, so that was one of the most meaningful race weekends of, of my career, and probably his. You need to work together, you need to, you need to get on with it now. You need to tell Jamie, you need to get on with it now, or else you're going to get fucked, so both cars need to go. But we've got a huge battle going between the teammates from Red Bull. Oh, have they got enough length there? Are they, are they, they can't couple. He's can't. too far in. Oh, dude, that's, that's costly. Faster. Oh, you're kidding me. Second year in a row. been the championship leader, um, even though they haven't won every year, for decades. You are champion! Yeah. There's no question that we became the team that we are today because of the competitive nature of Triple Eight and what's required to beat them. They're just relentless with everything. Everything is, you know, engineered and done to the nth degree. Oh, clearly remember the friction. It was proper dislike. It wasn't even just for show. What they've been able to do is just keep on whacking, whacking, whacking bikes across a long period of time now. And the, yes, there's been teams that have popped up and fought, but things tend to fade away. I came into the category when Jamie and Craig were at the top of their game. And I was a rookie trying to sort of just beat them or at least compete with them. And then by the end of it, they were trying to knock me off the top. It actually goes back more of a generational thing because my dad used to race against Roland and, and they were fierce rivals as well in British touring cars back in the day. So it's Vauxhall, Honda, Volvo. So by that nature, you know, the rivalry was obviously pretty embedded in our team and, and in theirs. All three of the organisations, you know, Walkinshaw, FPR and Penske, they provided very, very formidable competition that we had to deal with. Fierce competition on and off the circuit is a cornerstone of supercar racing. Triple Eight Race Engineering came to Australia from the UK in 2003 with a championship winning reputation. By 2005, with Craig Lowndes leading the driving charge, the engineering group began to gel and in the process, the existing competitive order was disturbed, setting up what unfolded over the next 15 years as a series of ferocious rivalries. The, the competitive counterforces to Triple Eight included three main rivals. In the mid 2000s, the ongoing warfare with the Walkinshaw family carried over from their British Championship battles via the Holden Racing Team and HSV Racing. Hold your breath, Australia, oh! and win a lot of eggs on. Followed by a period of serious resistance from Ford Performance Racing, originally operated by another outfit with British ties, ProDrive. And the most recent white-hot chapter of intense rivalry unfolded in the form of Dick Johnson Racing Team Penske. <laughs> They've gone berserk at Shell V Power Racing. Woo, yes! Searching for success against this backdrop of competition is an equation often defined by less than one-tenth of a second per lap. Exploiting such small margins of performance is no simple task. At the front line is the senior engineer with the responsibility to get the most from the driver, playing a complex role of scientist, strategist, and even a counsellor. 
consistency has been one of the great and impressive aspects of the Van Gisbergen Triple Eight game in 2021. If Waters gets you off the start, try and pass him. Yeah. Okay. So don't just sit behind him and conserve. Yeah. Go get him. It is a very important and interesting relationship, the driver race engineer relationship. Get a feel for the brakes and for the, for the change if we can, depending on what the tyres are like. You have to understand each other be able to read each other without actually talking to each other in some ways like any good relationship I suppose so you need to know when he's having a good day and a bad day and, and what you need to say and when you need to say it. Teams constantly play a high stakes game of cat and mouse. It's not unusual for an engineer and driver to craft a unique code for their radio conversations to determine a strategy play or even sell a decoy to their opponents. Yeah, I need to learn those two. Carry on, it's pit. Gap, close the gap. So we'll do that one today, if we want to do a dummy. Yeah, carry on. Nice, uh, nice driving, mate, carry on. Yeah. You don't want to get an advantage by letting your competitors know what changes you're making. So during practice and qualifying, we'll, we'll plug into the car and, and speak to the driver with, a, with an intercom system. We can discuss what's happening, privacy and secrecy. And uh, strategy? Strategy, I think, with this one, hopefully if it's status quo is there and we're, we're ahead, we can we can push the boat out on this one to mid-race. Fire it up, please, mate. Fire it up. Can you just fucking ease up a little bit, or what? <laughs> hey, this is where it counts. Van Gisbergen has maintained an iron grip so far. Can anybody wrestle it away today? Cam Waters has been able to clear Van Gisbergen. Jamie Winkup makes a run here into second place as well, and Van Gisbergen goes from first to third. Tires are coming up, mate. Tires forward, tires don't During the race, we can't plug in anything, so we're speaking across the radio. Good start, mate. Good start. Let's just work with them there. Let's just move forward. Great job. That's publicly broadcast for TV and, and the likes to, to understand what's what's happening with the race. He has a look. He feeds the nose down the inside. Waters leaves space, and that's a clean move for the lead. Great driving, mate. Eyes forward now. Let's get some gap, please. Copy. Some drivers want more information or less information. So I think once you've worked with someone for long enough, they're all the things that just become automatic. And then all your energy can be focused on how do we make the car go faster. Fastest car on the circuit. Great driving. Nice and smooth. So Winkup's able to do it. He's got him. Watch this. Can Boston park it where he needs to be? He's actually got the wheels locked. He ran into him. Man, I thought he was going to spear Winkup off the road try not to divulge any secrets or any strategy during the race. And sometimes those calls can be made super last minute, coming out the last corner and we'll get on the radio and tell the driver to come in. You still think it's strategy B, mate? Yeah, yeah, the not very good. Okay, mate, carry on. In this lap, in this lap. And we're having short stop here. I'll be sent off the board. Sent off the board. Beautiful. So he's come into the race weekend with 45 race victories and is about to seal another. This is the last lap. This is the last lap. And this will mean that he's going to be unbroken so far for the first six races of the year. And that puts him right up there with the elite. Yeah, yeah boys. Nice boy. driving. Nice driving. One, two for Triple A, mate. Beautiful teamwork. Thank you. Awesome job, guys. Thank you. Great work, guys. Great work. One, two. Beautiful work. Good job, mate. Good job, mate. <laughs> yeah, boss. <laughs> Fucking hell, I mean. Happy days. Mm. I wasn't sure that was all going to work out mm. at the start. Shane at the moment doesn't really have that rival. He moves it to the inside. Cam Waters. Now can he get around here? This is the one that we need to look at. Cam Waters will definitely right now will mix it. Chas Mostert will basically get the elbows out where you've got other drivers that sort of somehow either run wide or let him go. 
because they're thinking about the long game, but instead of trying to you know, force the issue, they'll sort of yield to him. And, and again, it's credit to him that, he, that Shane's been able to carry that. You've got wind come up on the outside of Boston. Here comes Ben. Oh, 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 on the inside. That is unbelievable. Shane and Triple Eight have obviously been very fast. I think the Holdens in general have been really fast, to be honest. Unbelievable drive. Shane Van Gisbergen is the winner at Sandown after 36 crazy laps. There's one guy cleaning up the championship in the first five races of the year. It's uh, very tough mentally, but, you know, it's... You try not to focus on other people too much because then you just lose focus of yourself. I forgot to tell you, yesterday you said the word gap. Yeah, I know. Yeah, Close the know. gap to him, but it was the, lap three or something. I know, yeah. Oh, fuck. I said it and then I was going to say something, yeah. but I, I was like, he's smart enough to know the window's yeah. not open. Better? Well, it's better than last qualifying. A little bit tail at the last corner, but I think it's better. I'd like the front. The front's good for me. So yesterday it was all about Shane Van Gisbergen. Today he's on row three. It's his teammate, Jamie Wincup, that's up on the outside. So there's a lot of oil on the circuit. Yeah, I told you. Yeah, okay. They put stuff over it or it's just still. Yeah, put shore dust all over it and haven't touched it. Alright, yeah, see what happens with this oil, buddy. Um, yeah. Let's uh, play the long game. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we can fucking win, okay? Yeah. Let's roll. Alright. We're set for our second sprint race in Tasmania. As they roar to life in Tassie, and a great start by both of those on the front row of the grid, but it's Waters. There's contact there with Jack LeBrock. He's also gone into the fence on the right-hand side. So oh. Dennis Wiley's been turned by LeBrock. Oh, who was that on, on the right-hand side there? They had nothing to change it. Meantime, at the front of the field, how quickly things change in this game. The big drag race down to turn six. Yes, go, 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 go. A bit of side drafting action, but it'll also put Jamie out there on that oil. The can just tries to make sure that he feeds him enough bumper to keep him out there. And there's a bit of push and shove, and Jamie just makes sure that he returns serve. So, a bit of gamesmanship on the run down the back straight then, and it falls in favour of Winkle. Excellent. Good luck. Tremendous performance by these guys today. Cream of the crop one more time. Yeah! That's Maximum points, Jamie Wincup strikes back in Tasmania. Great team effort, guys. One, two. Thank you. Yeah, boys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Good yeah. Good 21 of the last 31 races in Tasmania have been won by a Triple Eight prepared car. So they've obviously got the ingredients that work at this place. In addition to fielding cars in the Supercars Championship Series, Triple Eight Race Engineering manufactures and supplies cars and components for other teams. The team's based off engineering, so we'd engineer a component, we'd then hopefully race it a couple of times if we got you know, the, the tick of approval that it was reliable, it was better, it was faster, but then all of a sudden it become a customer's product. That's your brake, that's your throttle. I need some of these. <laughs> every race car that's out there running around has our pedal box. So we manufacture everything for every car. As a Holden and GM homologation team, their manufacturing base and team in Queensland is responsible for the design and development of all the GM Supercars product. For the 2021 season, Matt Stone Racing Team 18 and Techno Autosports all run Triple Eight built cars, with many more components supplied across the field. Waters and Mostert look like they're good down the right hand side. I wonder what they're doing there then. Shit, yeah. shit, left, left hand side, leave one for the race. See how we go. See what happens. We, we, we're locked in now. You've got your best right rear tyre on the car now. Looking at his tyres, he's got pretty average rears on the car. I can't see what mustard has got. It's, it's hard to tell. I think Will's, Will's similar to us looking at his rear tyres. Just so you know, my mentality is going to be aggressive. It's probably a bit harder to win this one. 
If, if everyone starts to stop like the same lap as us, or you know, the next lap and react, then it's just car pace. You know, and tire for tire, you can have it. Last time round for the Tasmania Super Sprint of 2021. Jamie looks for the crisscross, but he covers him. Oh. Van Gisbergen and Winkup. So that was a little exchange. Is this where RD is on the back saying, JJ, no risk? Yeah. Oh, that's right. Waiting for the text. So we've got a huge battle going between the teammates from Red Bull. Give the spot back to Jamie, please. Give the spot back to Jamie. Yes, Bobby. You two need to work together. You need to, two need to get on with it now. We need to tell Jamie we need to get on with it now, or else we're going to get fucked. So both cars need to go. Lost it. Fastest lap. Can't be 10 seconds. Just give me a little bit of fuel saving again, buddy. So here's the Red Bull cars parked up in 5th and 6th at the moment and it's going to be about just achieving solid points from this point on. But out of the final corner, Chaz Mostert finally breaks through for the first time since 2019. Yeah boy, well done! Woo! Yeah! This is quite so work out. As it's planned so, but uh, still solid points for the weekend, mate. Well done. And this is a big, big breakthrough for Walkinshaw and Ready United. From Tasmania 2021, stretching all the way back to Great Britain in the late 90s, Walkinshaw versus Dane, an existential battle. The relationship with Walkinshaw predates being in Australia. He was incredibly well established when I was just an upstart. Fantastic driver in his own right, let alone uh, running teams. My dad obviously knew him and raced against him. I think there was a mutual respect there. I know my dad knew and said that he was a strong competitor and probably the same as me. He was a pain in the ass and, and, hard, and hard to beat sometimes. So, um, you know, I don't, think, uh, I don't think anything's changed. <laughs> When Triple Eight Race Engineering headed down under, they initially met with a wall of competitive resistance. Look at this, three abreast as oh. they go to turn two. This is going to be ugly here. Absolutely did not like them <laughs> and wanted to beat them so badly week in, week out, so we had some fair battles. The Holden blokes are arguing. This is good news for Wing Cup. He could end up in the lead of this motor race. Look at Tanda. Inches, millimetres, less than that. Oh, clearly remember the friction. It was. It was proper dislike. It wasn't even just for show, it was proper dislike. And it was full one-upmanship type deal and there was all sorts of protests preloaded, ready to go in the background if this happened and if that happened and technical infringements and all sorts of stuff trying to play all the tricks that they'd probably learnt in the British Touring Car Championship. Scafey and Garth Tander, etc. those were the people that we were chucking, chucking darts at in the, in the canteen. They were the opposition and they were formidable. He got it. Jamie Winkup now has the race lead. One of the things that you do have to consider is what the competition is. What they've been able to do is just keep on whacking, whacking, whacking bikes across a long period of time now. This victory will make them Bathurst immortals. It's a one-two for Team Vodafone. Tanda third. Yes, there's been teams that have popped up and fought. The others have not been able to stay with them. One of the things that says is a relentless drive to continue to be competitive, and that's what they've done. For two decades plus, team to team, car to car, driver to driver, combat for touring car racing supremacy. Stone Brothers Racing, and both Walkinshaw teams. The Holden Racing Team and the HSV Dealer Team were cleaning up championships and Bathurst victories in short order. Good run out of the final corner. Is this Lounge's opportunity? By 2005, the Dane Empire slowly began to strike back. Lounge gets in. Scape doesn't want to yield, but he has to. New race leader setting up countless fierce battles with one or the other of the Walkinshaw teams. The winners, the Triple Eight team, give it up for Yvonne Muller and Craig Lowndes. 
In one memorable bout, tensions peaked and limits pushed in a grand final showdown. Whoever won was going to win a championship. And I don't think we've come down to that close before that we've actually gone into a last race, equal on points, and basically whoever, yeah, wins, wins. Everyone always scanned the radios. It was interesting some of the comments being told to Kelly at the start of the race, like, we don't need this chassis anymore, mate. Basically telling him that you're in front, take Lounsey out, you win the championship. All they had to do was survive the first sort of four or five laps and then sort of work into the race. Oh, race leader and Lowndes! That is Lowndes! He's been taken out of it! I was sideways in the middle of the corner. I tried to grab reverse and get out of the way. Will Davison come and KO'd us and we were gone. At that point, I knew the steering wheel was on an angle. All we could do was like six lap runs and we'd wear out the front tyres because we were just pushing. He's murdering both tyres, but in particular the front, which has got the majority of the damage on it. Unfortunately, we didn't have two cars up there working together to be able to effectively protect Lounsey. Rick Kelly is the champion for 2006. We finished the race, there was a huge hearing and there was a lot of pressure on all of us to, to make a decision. But Roland asked me, look, I'm happy if you want to keep, keep going to the next level, whether Rick should have been penalised further. At the end of the day, we dropped it. I look back on it thinking, well, if I hadn't have had so many failures in the DNFs and other things that I did wrong, we would have been far away up the road with a, with a clear championship point lead. Instead of going to the last race, equal on points, so at the end of the day, I failed as, as my part. It was one of those, probably the last best opportunities I could have won to win a championship. 10 years in the waiting, Lowndes and Wynn can do it! Unbelievable. Buoyed by the incredible Lowndes Win Cup Bathurst victory of 06. Oh, race leader at Lowndes! He's been taken out of it! And equally stung by the loss of the championship and the demise of Better Electrical and their critical financial support. Triple Eight bounced back into the following season with a bold new look and deal. Vodafone jumped on the line backing the team for an all-new glittering title assault. Wing Cup leads the championship, Lowndes is second, Tander is now... 2007, new colours, same old battles. Oh, he tries to go around the outside here. Whoa, side by side with Scape, and Wing Cup could go up the inside here. Garth Tander. Rick Kelly in the Walkinshaw owned HSV dealer team cars were in one of the key red corners. And Mark Scaife and Todd Kelly in the Walkinshaw owned Holden Racing team entries occupied the other. Another little contact, another, another and another. He's having a bit of a shove now. He's actually got him. He's got him. There was no quarter given to anyone on the racetrack between the four drivers. Will this ignite things? Tanders dropped a spot. Lowndes and Wincup were in the blue corner. At times, it was four against two. And then also we had part of the HRT thing, we had Mark Scaife and Todd Kelly as well, so they often got involved. So we sort of had the slide up and it was four versus two. Between them, the block of six heavyweights won the majority of races and rounds. But up over the top comes Garth Tander, as he's been doing for quite a while. Stop him! 2007 was a, was a great year. That wasn't my championship to win. I was trying to steal it off Garth. Kelly got off to a pretty good start. Tander and Wind Cup trail each other. A very aggressive move from Craig Lowndes to make sure he got in front of Mark Scaife. As it was the previous year, it boiled down to the grand finale at Phillip Island. If Jamie passed Todd for that position, we win the championship. If he doesn't, we don't win the change. After nine months on the road, this is what it's come down to. Who will deliver in the final race? This is my first time in racing where you've got a chance to win a championship. So you're sort of biting your tongue to not just go, just fucking pass him, mate. Wind Cup's done everything right. 
and he's just metres from the back of Todd Kelly's car and that margin that you can see is the difference between the 2007 championship. In the end, there will be just metres in it and only a couple of points to decide it as Todd Kelly takes out race three. Thank you so much. It's taken me 10 years to get here. Thanks so much for the opportunity. I was happy to be P2. Garth probably probably was the deserving winner in 2007 and, and got the got the chocolates. Garth Tander, he is the winner for 2007 from Toll HSV. The big West Australian gets the biggest prize on offer in Australian motorsport. In 2006, 2007, we lost both those championships by small margins in 2007, incredibly small margin, um, uh, because we weren't good enough. Ironically, the ultimate hammer blow in the battle between the Walkinshaw and Dane family competitive wrestle came in 2016. Huge news. The brand, Holden Racing Team in 2017, will move from Melbourne as we now know it and be part of the Red Bull squad next year. Triple Eight won the contract with General Motors to take on the role as the official GM factory team, spearheading the development of the new car. It was probably the right decision for Holden. They cut back their marketing budget and they had to choose a team and they'd had more success than we'd had. Were we upset? Obviously, we're going to be upset about that sort of thing, you know, especially losing it to someone who's a fierce rival of ours. Um, was it uh, a bad thing for the team? Short term, yes. Long term, no. It was a bombshell announcement and bitter blow for the Walkinshaw team, who'd run Holden's operations since the Peter Brock Holden dealer team era. This is no fluke. He was competitive here last year. He was right at the front of the field. He knocked everybody off in practice earlier. He beat them in the wet in qualifying. And for him to do this today, not just for Andre himself and his engineering group, but for that team, for Kelly Grove Racing, in a Mustang, superb. Absolutely superb. He squares it up coming out of the final quarter. It is a first time victory now for Andre Heimgartner, his first supercar win. Well done, well done. That's how much it means. <laughs> huge moment, huge moment for that team. The Probably going to be P9, mate, P9. Oh, well, that's, uh, that's quite disappointing. That's the way it is. Track condition changed and uh, we were relatively... Good at the start and got worse, yeah. It's your shit, though. Like, Jamie makes a mistake and then just pulls away, like... Fuck. Like, zero group, zero confidence, zero feel. Like. We are on standby for a little more rain, potentially, for this afternoon's race. Plenty of shit's going to go down in this race, yeah. so we're still in it. Let's, let's make sure we're smart, we're communicating lots. It's going to be a race of a bit of strategic um, and some smart driving, and we can win. What will the OGR Super Sprint deliver for us today? Get off the radio! Hit this lap, mate. Hit this lap. Radio They've got something going on with their radios. They've got an open key in one of the crew members at Red Bull. That's why Van Gisbergen's blowing up on the radio. Oh, have they got enough length there? They, they, they can't couple. He's can't. too far in. Oh, dude, that's, that's costly. Disaster. Jamie Winkup and his teammate Shane Van Gisbergen had a difficult afternoon with that pit stop that didn't quite go to plan and one or two moments running wide. Good drive, mate. Good recovery. Okay. Yeah. No matter what you do in racing, it's about understanding. You just try to understand as quick as you can what went wrong and what we can do about it. Sorry about the fuck up, Gertrude. All good, mate. Sorry, it happens. It's all right. We'll get back. 
everything is on the limit, everything we do, it's very, very small things are the difference between being a hero or, or being a loser. Um, and on that day, we were the loser. Slides in the ball game, and Waters is gone! It was Mostert and Waters that made contact as a result of Slade. Two of the top five contenders out early in race 10. That could have been very messy. Oh, yeah. Waters and Mostert are in the shed. Waters and Mostert are in the shed. Nice stop. That was perfect. But you would have never said from 13th that he was going to end up on the podium. So that's a great job by Van Gisberg and our championship leader. Good recovery, mate. Yeah, not bad. He has tasted victory before, but this one's going to be sweet. His first ever win for Shell V Power Racing, Anton Di Pasquale. Good job, mate. Good up. We need a couple of podium. We work slowly. I mean, it's easier when you start from the front. Rivalries evolve in motorsport. As a key 888 rival, Dick Johnson Racing is a prime example of a team on the results roller coaster. The 2010 Supercar Championship, a case in point. The grand final was a showdown between Dick Johnson Racing and Triple Eight. Driver James Courtney versus Jamie Wincup. 2010 was completely opposite to 2007. 07, it wasn't my championship to win. 2010, I felt like it was. You know, leading into that weekend, there was so much unknown as to what was going on. Either way, we'll have a first-time championship winner or a three-time championship winner. And, uh, yeah, the, the weekend was wild, and then that Saturday afternoon. Oh, it doesn't look healthy, does it? So the weather is an issue, the wipers are on, and uh, this gets even more complex, more of a nail-biter, more at stake. He's in the fence! They're both in the fence! They're all in the fence! Oh, unbelievable! Top three in the fence! They're all broken. Forget about it. Uh, this is just incredible. Two smouldering wrecks come into the pits and it's, it was literally a race in the pits to who can get the cars out to finish the race so that you can at least get some points and be classified as a finisher. Oh, it's got a broken disc. It's got a broken rotor. He's going to be there forever. I got the car back to the pits first and then it was just a battle between the mechanics to put the car together to get back out on the track and score some points. We had supercars watching over our repairs because you have to send the car out in a safe yeah, manner. Now what's it look like at the other end of town? It's gone too. He's going nowhere. Whereas the DJR boys didn't have that. They didn't have someone of that level watching. So they, they literally cable tied the car back together and sent it out. He's going to get out on this racetrack. The thing is a mess at the front. He's just got to be able to get around. It makes an awesome effort, awesome stuff, guys. The DJR car, it was just held together enough to get some points. <laughs> I don't think I would have wanted to look under the wheel well and seen what was actually holding it together because I'm pretty sure it was a lot of zip ties. But um, it wasn't the best handling car I've had for that lap. Look at the front of it. It's got negative camber on one side, positive on the other. It's covered in race tape. It's destroyed. My car could have done another 250 k's. It was brand new, ready to go again. The objective was to get the car out there, and they, they got it out there. They finished. They got the points. We were furious at the time, but looking back, it was actually quite, quite smart. But it did hold together, and, and we did get around. I just remember Adrian on the radio saying, just drive slowly <laughs> and stay in front of the lead car to get across the line so we could do that lap. So I can confirm that Jamie Wincup has been given a DNF. So that means that the, the car, we got it out like 30 seconds too late or something. It was so touch and go. But also we'd had other errors throughout the year. So it wasn't just that one. We, we definitely had some mistakes that uh, we, we shouldn't have made. He couldn't get close enough to James Courtney this weekend after the disaster yesterday. We had so many more pole positions. We had so many more race wins than, than Courtney who, who won it. But they, uh, they didn't have some of those DNFs that we did, and that was the difference. A new V8 supercar champion is crowned here at Sydney Olympic Park. It shows they are beatable with a similar sort of product. You know, they're not unstoppable, but to ultimately beat Triple Eight with their old car was uh, 
you know, that was fantastic and, and um, something that hasn't happened again. It was James's opportunity to steal the championship or fast. Wing Cup, after back-to-back -back champions, ends up second this year to our new champion. That's the one that got away. The, the losers of the world say, oh, well, there's always next year, but no. We missed out on 2010, and unfortunately, we're not getting that back. When legendary US businessman and race team owner Roger Penske arrived on the Australian scene, buying into Dick Johnson Racing, eventually, Triple Eight discovered another formidable competitor. When Roger Penske came along, they brought an incredible level of experience so that they could try and put their stamp on the DJR organization as it had been that needed a major lift. But they also threw money at it in a way which we could never do. As it was when Roland Dane first tackled the Australian scene, success was intermittent for DJR Team Penske. With the key appointments of Ludo Lacroix as the technical director and Kiwi Scott McLaughlin leading the driving charge, DJR Team Penske became a serious roadblock for Triple Eight. We really enjoyed those battles, enjoyed the um, the rivalry we had because it spurred us all on. Oh, there's some games being played with Shane. They're bumping, they're bumping along the straight. We were somewhat mystified, wondering what was going on, and it's still going on, and he's turned him. McLaughlin has turned Van Gisbergen at turn two. Throughout 2017, 18, 19, and 20, their battles were truly epic. At times, spiteful. We were getting a little frustrated because they were they were pushing the rules, so to speak. It's your job in motorsport to to push the rules as much as you possibly can. But um, we thought they were stepping over the line in some areas. What went on at Bathurst in 2019, I personally would have never ever done because our sponsors wouldn't have supported us to do it. They would have been shocked. Double stack is going to be an issue here for 17 and 12. It won't be as big an issue for Triple Eight and 97. There's a difference between having a little bit of subtle slowing down in those situations, which a lot of people have done, and something as blatant as what happened in 2019. Slow down, slow down. Double stack, box this flat. He's slowed, he's backed them all off. Have a look at the gap now. Slow down, slow down. Jeffers, Jeffers, Jeffers. Has he got a bigger issue? There could be trouble over this. If you do that to the field, then you could end up with a pretty severe penalty if he is in fact backing them up. To me, that was unforgivable and honestly tainted the sport, tainted the Bathurst 1000. He did drop back a long way. He wasn't having any trouble before the safety car, so what was the story? Well, uh, it's one of those things, isn't it? Scott McLaughlin wins the Super Team Auto Bathurst 1000 of 2019. They didn't need to do that to win. They could have had a bloody good battle with us and whoever else was quick that day and probably still won without having to resort to that sort of tactic. It's pretty obvious what happened, but it is what it is. That car's been sacrificial lamb all year, so deal with it. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Stop it, man. The OTR Super Sprint at the bend, the final race of the weekend. What's wrong with Pasquale? Engine issues. Pivotal stop for Tickford. Slap of the race to get out in front. Keep this lap, no option. Keep this lap. He's going to have a big crack down the inside and gets him. Fuck, lap too late. Fuck! Give me a few 
few good laps. Come on. It is still 0.5 of a second. Van Gisbergen throwing everything at us. Tickford Racing and previous iterations of the Melbourne-based Ford outfit have maintained an ever-present rivalry with Triple Eight. Up until the 2012, our opposition was Mark Winterbottom and Will Davison in the Falcons. The last year of Project Blueprint, you know, 2012, where Triple Eight and and what we were then FPR won every single race for the entire year. that period they would have been the best funded team in pit lane so uh, it was always going to end up as, yeah, as a battle between us. The foundation of the tension stems all the way back to karting warfare between Mark Winterbottom and Jamie Wincup as junior racers. We've battled for years. We could have some pretty cool karting stories that people have never seen. Some of the best racing we did was back in karting. For some reason, because you've grown up together and there's so much history there, we really enjoy beating each other. Jamie carrying better speed through eight. Winterbottom got a bit crossed up in the middle of the corner. Done. The respect is always there, but um, you don't want to be nice to them and like them because when you like someone, you, you probably take it easier on them. We've had some big battles and, and on, on, on some big days as well. That was the race winning edge for Winterbottom. Fight and fight and fight till there's no fight left. Ultimately, Winterbottom and Ford Performance Racing, as they were known at the time, climbed to the top spot at Bathurst in 2013. If there is one defining moment in the battle between these two outfits, the 2014 Bathurst 1000 sums up their tumultuous combat. Chazzy and I started off the back row of the grid. We led the race with, with a lap to go, you know. It's an unbelievable storyline. Wind Cup is out of fuel. We didn't qualify, started from last, had an accident, went down a lap, and we still won the race. He's genuinely one of those people who will always make you feel at home and part of the team. And we owe him such a lot. But it is Craig Lowndes Day and Lowndes is back. And at that point, I think the team's focus and mentality completely changed. Craig coming on board 2005, we yeah, have was fundamental uh, to the success of Triple Eight. Craig Lowndes drives into the history books. Unbelievable natural ability. You can take a wheel off the car and Lowndes would not. But I can say with a heavy heart, this has been the hardest decision that myself and the team have had to make.